Hi everyone, this is uh, Bruce and Erica Bloomquist. Hey guys. Welcome to Steel Creek Saturday Night Resurrection Service. And uh, we're gonna open us up in prayer tonight. Uh, we're gonna pray for the country of China uh, this week. Uh, every week we pray for a different country. And then after that, I'm gonna um, pray uh, to give God glory for his resurrection. And then we'll go into the worship uh, time and then a time in the word uh, with Wade. So uh, please join me as we open up in prayer. By the way, we really miss you guys. And um, I really look forward to the time where we could see each other face to face and, and get like an air pump, air, air fist pump or, a, or an air hug or something. So um, Lord, uh, we lift up the nation of China to you tonight. Uh, China of all places where this pandemic started, Lord. And we pray for the Chinese church too, and all the um, opportunities that they uh, have right now uh, as people are dying. Uh, we lift up the lost Chinese. Lord, may they turn to you even right now uh, during this time, Lord, as, as uh, uh, mortality is at the front and center of their lives. And uh, we ask you to have mercy upon China and the Chinese church. Lord Jesus, there is no one who has ever lived that compares to you. You are the centerpiece of the universe. Only your grave is empty. And we give you the highest praise tonight, God. Death couldn't hold you and the grave couldn't keep you. You said in John eleven twenty five, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Lord, you weren't just resurrected, you are the resurrection. Lord Jesus, you are our resurrection. And without you, there is no eternal life. There is no hope for us. And we just wanna praise you and thank you so much tonight, Lord. We celebrate your resurrection, O King Jesus. This alone gives us great faith to say, O death, where is thy sting? That we might live for eternity with you in paradise. Lord Jesus, our faith and our hope and our joy is in you alone tonight, and we lift up your mighty name. We give you the highest praise, King Jesus. Glory to the risen Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Good, good evening, and um, happy, happy Easter to all of you. Um, gosh, we're really excited to worship with you um, tonight. Um, I just want to invite you wherever you are in your home, um, just to just prepare your hearts to join into song with us. Um, I just want to say that something really precious that's on my heart tonight as we go into worship is I remember the story of Peter when he was in the boat during the storm and he saw Jesus and Jesus called him to come out and walk upon the waves and how Peter had his eyes fixed on Jesus. And um, when he began to take in the circumstances around him and um, take his eyes off of Jesus, he began to, to be so full of fear and fall. and. Um, we were talking with some friends um, last night and we, we kept talking about keeping our eyes on Jesus. And I've been thinking about that a lot of today. And I, I um, wanna invite you in this time um, for all of us to turn our eyes on Jesus, um, to really just sit and allow the revelation of the wonder of the cross and the resurrection and what Jesus has done to wash over our souls, that we would fix our eyes on him and that we would worship him from that place. Um, I don't know how all of you are tonight. Some of you might be doing well, but some of you may be full of fear and anxiety. And I just want to invite you right now to fix your eyes on Jesus. And that when we worship him, when we come into his presence, it is a beautiful thing. And he gives us peace and he gives us 
um, gosh, just, just such a wonderful, um, deep, real peace. And may we honor him, even from the sacrifice of praise and wherever we are, whatever circumstance. So let's just pray together. Lord God, we, we come into your presence, Lord, right now. Holy Spirit, will you come? Just, just come, Holy Spirit. And just dwell in our homes and just in our midst. We want to worship you. We want to worship you, Lord.
star if you hold my heart one who's first and last wiped away my past perfect royalty made
Jesus Christ, a perfect sacrifice. You are beautiful. Our hopes in you are says that that right now in heaven that the angels are are singing this before the throne of God worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive blessing and glory and honor and I just I just want to encourage us all right now to realize that we are engaging in the same worship that heaven is singing and that's just a really really beautiful picture so I just want to just invite you to even just, just close your eyes and to sing these words to a God who is so real and so worthy. May we just join the praises of heaven right now. Let's sing that again. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he.
We adore you. We adore you, God. We lift our eyes to you right now. We declare your worthiness and your lordship over our lives. And we acknowledge, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are seated in power and majesty. And as we celebrate this weekend of your remembering your resurrection we thank you that that all the more assures not only to us but to the world that you're coming back again lord we pray that within us here as your church you'd find us ready and eagerly looking for your return and we can't wait god we are so looking forward to the day that we're going to join with the angels and those who have gone before us to sing this song the song of the worthiness of the lamb of god to sing the song of the redeemed, to declare your holiness for eternity. We just give you, Lord, this time, and even as, Lord, we look into your word, we pray, God, just sear the truth of your word in our hearts, God, that we would be changed by it, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds, and that, Lord, our lives would make sense in light of your resurrection. 
We ask this in faith. We thank you for your love, for your grace, and we thank you for your presence in each of our homes right now. We just ask you, Lord, have your way with us and let us hear clearly your voice from your word now at this time. And may our hearts just say, yes, Lord, to what you want to do in us as we respond in faith. We ask this, O God, and we glorify you in the mighty, matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the saints agree by saying, Amen. I just want to give a, just a shout out of love to everyone who's joined us right now and, and uh, celebrate this weekend with you. I want to get in the words with a couple of things concerning the um, implications of the resurrection and how it should impact each of our lives. But I want to give a shout out to um, Diane for your celebrating your birthday. We just honor you, sister. You bring so much joy to all of us. And we thank you for uh, all that you mean to us and all that you do for the glory of God. So God bless you. Happy birthday to Diane. Also our brother, Doug. Uh, it's his birthday. So we honor his leadership and his humility. Um, God bless you, brother. Well, listen, I want to, um, I'm not going to focus on this time together on the historicity of the resurrection as much. If you wanted to go back and look at that in last year's um, Resurrection Weekend message that I shared, I talked about like the Roman historian and Senator uh, Tacitus, uh, Josephus, all these things that evidenced the reality of the resurrection. Um, there's obviously a lot of resources out there. Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict. Uh, Lee Strobel, some of you guys know about him, and uh, actually they did a movie on, on his life, his story, which is very powerful. I recommend, if you haven't seen it, called The Case for Christ. Very good. They did a great job, and his book is really well. But here are atheists who set out to disprove Christianity, and they knew that all of it hinged on whether Jesus Christ had risen from the dead or not. And so as they went after that, they found this overwhelming amount of evidence. In fact, I want to read one quote from Strobel to you. Here's a former atheist, a journalist uh, for the Chicago Tribune, who ends up giving his life to Jesus Christ after this. And this is what he said. He said, in short, I didn't become a Christian because God promised I would have even a happier life than I had as an atheist. He never promised any such thing. Indeed, Following him would inevitably bring divine emotions in the eyes of the world. Rather, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved his divinity by rising from the dead. That meant following him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. So, how true. And there's really only two choices that we have concerning the resurrection Either it is true or it's not, and if anyone does the research, uh, him being appearing before 500 people, uh, the evidence that the Jews could not present his body, nor the Romans, to the torturous ways that his servants, his apostles died, on and on and on. There's the evidence of the resurrection. But what I want to share briefly at this time is, what does the resurrection mean uh, about not only who Jesus is, but also in our lives. So I want to want to draw some points to that really quickly. And I want us to pray these things into our lives at the end. So let's go into them, all right? Number one, I know obviously some of these are clear, but I want to just speak these out from the Word of God with you right now. So number one, what does the resurrection imply? It implies that Jesus is the Messiah and he fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. Now, those of you who know that this is a big stickler for me, that we as the church need to be able to validate our Lord and our Savior as he did uh, from the Old Testament. It says, this is the, what Paul said about the gospel, that it's it, that according to 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised again according to the scriptures. So we need to know what scriptures those are from the Old Testament. So here are some that you are probably familiar with, but let's be reminded tonight that Jesus rose and he fulfilled these Old Testament scriptures. Isaiah 53, 
It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. So there you are right before talking about Jesus being crucified or or, or dying for sin, the sins of uh, Israel, and that it's saying he was offering for sin. And then it says in Isaiah 53 that he will prolong his days. Hosea chapter 6, it says, After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Psalm 16, which is probably the most quoted of all the verses in the New Testament concerning the resurrection of Jesus, where David prophesies, he says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And of course, Peter and the others pointed out that David did see corruption. He wasn't speaking of himself. He was speaking of Messiah and that he would, his body would be raised up to validate his Messiahship and, and of course, uh, his way, the salvation that would come through his death. So that's really what the resurrection also points. It's the other verse, obviously, we also know another one is Jonah. Three days, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so Jesus would be in the belly of the earth for three days. So as Messiah validates this about his resurrection, that it validates everything he said as well. And Jesus said very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. Or where Jesus says in John 8, verse 23 and 24, he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We know that the Word of God says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So the resurrection of Jesus validates also his atoning death, that he is the Messiah that's come to save the world. This is why he says in Luke 9, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and be killed. And then he prophesies himself and be raised the third day. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 22. So our own Lord Jesus Christ prophesied his own resurrection. So number one, it validates his Messiahship. Number two, it also validates that Jesus is God come in the flesh. We know that Matthew said his name will be Emmanuel. God is with us. But how does it also validate that he's in another place, that the resurrection proves he is the Son of God or, or God incarnate? Deuteronomy 32, in the Song of Moses, Moses is declaring the word of the Lord, and God says in Deuteronomy 32, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. So here you have Yahweh declaring, I am the one that makes alive. And then in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, you have Jesus say, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Jesus says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So this again, corresponding with Deuteronomy 32, saying only Yahweh can bring life. And here Jesus says, I have the power to raise my own life. This is also seen in John 5, 21, if you wanted another reference. And then, of course, another one of the deity of Christ is also seen, of course, quoted many times in the New Testament in Psalm 110, where David says, the Lord, speaking of Yah- that's Yahweh in the Hebrew, said to my Lord, Adon or Adonai, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. So this is why Jesus said to uh, the Pharisees, how could David call Lord that, who, that was who his son? 
and and that shows again that this is not a mere just the seed of david but this is the son of god as he, jesus said in john 8 before abraham was i am okay number 3 a third thing that resurrection does is that it, it validates the eternality of the soul of course you had one of the up the ones that were opposing jesus being the sadducees who denied basically the supernatural they denied the resurrection and how did jesus respond to that of course he quoted from really the books that the sadducees only held to and that is the torah the first five books and he used the book of exodus to disprove them by saying um that when he was addressing moses uh, he said i am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not I was, showing that they were alive, uh, that their souls were alive. So for the resurrection of Jesus, this shows to us that our souls are eternal. And that this is why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe... This is the corresponding truth, that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Of course, this isn't just in the New Testament. This is also the, the truth of the resurrection is in the Old Testament as well. Uh, some people think, well, you know, there's even, obviously even some cults who say uh, they call soul sleep or uh, that there'll be annihilationism, and in the Old Testament teaches this, that they sleep, there's nothing there. This is not even what it says in the Old Testament as well. In Daniel chapter 12, it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then da Daniel says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever so in closing I, I saw this quote by henry drummond who said this on what does the christian argument for immortality really rest he says it stands upon the pedestal on which the theologian rests the whole of historical christianity the resurrection of jesus christ number four what does the resurrection apply is that it should impact the way that we view our possessions so we're going to get now to how this applies to us um, I thought about the scripture in Luke 12, where Jesus says, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store up all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? And then Jesus says this in application, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So, the resurrection of Jesus should change the way we look at our possessions, that we see it, that as Jesus says, we're not to store treasures on earth, but we store treasure in heaven, where they cannot be corrupted and where thieves cannot break in and steal. And it also causes us to have the revelation that we are stewarding what God has given to us. Just as Jesus says in Matthew 25, talks about the, the servant that was given five and then two, and then you remember the one that he, he rebukes. I'm going to read this to us right now and why Jesus gave this and how he, why this person, this servant, was rebuked. It says in Matthew 25, 26, But this Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy 
servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back on my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. And then Jesus says, for to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have, have abundance. But from him who does not have, again, see this also comparing it with Luke chapter 12, that those they had, but they were not rich toward God. And so it makes all the difference in the world. It says that he will have an abundance, but from who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer, in the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So why is it that, that this one was rebuked and there was the, was the consequence of judgment? It's revealed right there when the servant says, I knew you to be. And then, and then the response from the Lord, that is Jesus saying, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew. So it is, it's the knowledge, it's the accountability of knowing what we ought to do. And if Jesus, and he has risen from the dead, then we as followers of the Lord, are called to look at our finances differently, not like the world, but we are to sow into the work of the kingdom. I was, as I was praying about this, my mind, I believe, we even went to, um, if you're familiar with the Didache, the Didache, which in the Greek means teachings, was from the teachings of the apostles. They say that date at, at the latest, second, the second century. It's, and and they, many believe it's to the very first century that those writings uh, date to of the early church. And I just want to read this to you. This is, this should show us how far we have strayed really as a church concerning finances and ministries. Uh, and the first ones accountable are to the church leaders. Listen to what the Didache says about the application of this issue of finances. This is like almost like a training manual to the early church in order and how to, how to be a disciple. This is what it says. It says, let every apostle who comes to you be received as the Lord, but he shall not remain more than one day or two days if there is a need. But if he remains three days, he is a false prophet. And when the apostle goes away, let him take nothing but bread until he lodges. If he asks for money, he is a false prophet. But whoever says in the spirit, give me money, or something else, you should not listen to him. But if he tells you to give for others' sake who are in need, let no one judge him. And then it goes on to say this, Woe to him who receives, for if one receives who has, not, has, has need, he is guiltless. But he who receives not having need shall pay the penalty why he received and for what. And coming into confinement, he shall be examined concerning the things which he has done he shall not escape from there until he pays back the last penny. So I know this isn't scripture, but you, you can see from how far we have swung in the church today, where we have whole ministries pleading for money, not for themselves, or not for the cause of the gospel or for other things, although sometimes that, that is, it can be feigned, it can be pretended to be that. But we are coming to a place where uh, even church leaders are showing little difference than the world in, in the lifestyle that they live and the amount of money that's coming into their own pockets. Uh, th this, is, this ought not to be. We as the church should be showing by our lifestyle and by what we have that we are not living for this world but the one to come. And uh, that doesn't mean that we're living in some austere, uh, you know, like a monk or, or some kind of a lifestyle that, that denies the, the enjoyments that God gives to us, you understand what I'm saying, that it should show that we are about storing treasures in heaven. And, uh, and our lifestyle shows that this is consistent with the message that we believe and the one that we follow in Jesus Christ. And this is not just in the Didache. Obviously, we know that Paul's very clear about this in First Timothy chapter 6. Let's do, uh, I want to do these last three with you. It also impacts our view, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and our, with our endurance with trials. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, he said, Therefore we do not lose heart, for even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, for our, our light affliction is but for a moment. 
is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So the resurrection of Christ, my friend, I want to, my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us. It impacts the way we deal with trials. Paul says this is a momentary affliction. It can't be compared to the eternal weight of glory. There is a real desire that our Lord has to give rewards. This is his idea. It's, it's not our idea, and, it, and it's not our ultimate motive. We do it for the glory of God. But it was pleasing in God's eyes that we would understand that our trials, if we endure them, there will be a reward. And those rewards, I pray with you, that we can lay them at his feet one day. This is what the crown of life this is what Jesus talked about in Revelation chapter 2 to the church of Smyrna, as well as James talked about in chapter 1. The crown of life is given to those that endure trials. That's promised because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so let's celebrate this. This isn't something that uh, that's not pleasing to God, but, but his resurrection that we say, Lord, because of this, I thank you that I can endure these trials. It's an internal perspective. And even you promised a reward if I will endure it. And even to the very end, Jesus says this, in Revelation 22, he ends the book of Revelation this way. He says, and behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So let us, let us be reminded, even if you're going through a trial right now, be encouraged that it, it is to be brought into the perspective of eternity. And that one day, as you endure this, as you give it to the Lord, as you seek Him and ask for wisdom in the midst of it, God says His reward is with those that, are, that, that overcome. So be encouraged by that. Number six, Jesus' resurrection should make us fearless. I often quote this, and, and I, it's, I think we need to be reminded of all, all the time, Revelation 12, 11. It talks about the victory, that have, how we overcome the enemy. This is a tremendous point of spiritual warfare where it says we overcome him by three things. And each of those addresses a, a point of warfare by the enemy. So the first one, the blood of the lamb. This is the primary way the enemy attacks is by accusation. He's called the accuser of the brother. So the blood of the lamb gives us victory by his accusations and his slander against us. And we are declared righteous by faith in what Jesus has done on the cross. Second of all, by the word of our testimony. What does the power of testimony do? It brings faith. The enemy is constantly trying to sow seeds of doubt. Is God really with you? Is God really, does he really care? Is he aware of what's going on in your life? And when you hear testimonies, it releases faith and encouragement that God very much is involved and he knows every detail and that, and that testimony shows how he's currently moving in our lives. <clears throat> and that should encourage us. And then third, they love not their lives unto death. What is that? That's, that addresses the issue of fear. Listen to what Hebrews 2 says. In so much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, Jesus, he himself, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The reason why we can overcome is because Jesus died to free us from the power and the fear of death, and his resurrection now gives us that complete assurance. And this is why in the early church, you've heard testimonies of how they were even able to carry people uh, during the plague and did not have that fear. And it was a tremendous testimony to those around. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be wise and loving by social distancing and all those things. If anything, for the sake of the other person's conscience, that's an act of love. In this time, we, we obey that, we submit to that. But there should be no fear in our hearts. We are to walk fearless because the last fear that the devil had was the fear of death. And if that's been taken away, then there is nothing left. We are walking in peace and we are ready to be with Jesus whenever that day would come. 
And then finally, the implication of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it prioritizes the gospel. And this was the priority of our Lord. Right after his resurrection, he appears for 40 days on the earth to some 500 people. And what does he say right before he leaves, before he ascends? He says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was the priority of Jesus, that upon the last words on the earth, that they would know, this is what you're called to now. You go and you be my witnesses. And this is what he says also in the end of Luke. During, after his appearances, after he's already been resurrected, what does he say? He says, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So this is what we are called. By the resurrection, this is the priority in our lives, and that is of the gospel. So before I pray, I just want to share, let me, let me give you one testimony that happened just today. Um, my son and I went, and I've never met this woman, but she had a need because she didn't have the strength to push her mower up these hills near where she was. I thought it was a, a residence. I didn't know where I was going. But as we went to this dear sister, uh, Miss Betty Marlin, she has a clinic in an impoverished area of Charlotte. Uh, and it's changed a lot. The light that's been there has changed the area. It's, even, it's much better even now than what it was. But even now, there's you know, prostitutes around, there's, there's some drug selling that's going on. And this 76-year-old woman has been there since the 1980s with this volunteer-only clinic where she has been loving on people for these decades and being a light. And as I talked to her, she said, I was just saying, well, praise the Lord. And I was celebrating just what, how she's been medically meeting all these needs. And she gave me some testimonies. But she looked at me and she said, but it's all about souls. It's all about souls. And she said, this is what I want to leave with you. She, she was challenged by the area. And she here's a woman, she lives up near Statesville, driving 45 minutes every time to come down. And she just goes around first and cleans all the trash that comes and accumulates every day, cleaning the trash and other volunteers coming and cleaning up. But she makes this block this little corner as pretty as she can. And then and people begin to come. 45 minutes, she drives down. And she said that what, what convicted her was, she said, I'm just one person. Can, can, there, can I do really of anything of significance? And she gave herself to the Lord. Lord, if you can use me, if I can make one bit of difference, then use me. And this is how the Lord Honor that prayer of surrender. She responded. That's the reality of the resurrection and a regenerated heart that begins to look and say, Lord, what is your will for my life? What are you calling me to do to have an impact that I will prior prioritize the gospel in my life? And this saint chose to follow the Lord on this path where he led her to buy this building that was a, a nightclub and then turned it into this clinic. And now serves, has, I don't know how many countless number of people she's served, um, but has led many to Christ and has shared the, the good news of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, let us surrender. Let us worship the Lord now and thank him that the resurrection this weekend validates the Messiahship of Jesus, that it, it, it validates that he is God come in the flesh. 
let us celebrate the reality of the eternality of the soul that we know that this is an it that this is because we die it's not the end we're going to go and spend eternity with god to those who know jesus christ let it impact the way that we look at our finances our gifts that we steward it for the glory of god uh, let us also let it in, uh, impact the way we look at trials in our lives that lord this is temporary Help me, God. You rose from the dead. You've called me to be victorious. And, and Lord God, I, I want to receive that crown of life in the end that you promised to those who overcome trials that I can lay that crown at your feet and worship you. And let the resurrection of Christ make us fearless. Well, there's nothing else to fear but the fear of death. If, if he has promised everlasting life, let us walk in victory in this area and know that we also are called to be bold witnesses. And then lastly, let it prioritize the gospel in our lives. So let, let's just pray together. And I wanted to finish with just a, a couple of more songs of worship and response. As you're singing, as you're worshiping, can I just encourage you just to be asking God to search your heart. Lord, let the, the reality of the resurrection, the implication, change my life. Let it impact these areas of my life. And so as we close in prayer, as we just worship with these songs, let the Holy Spirit search you and let, let us take this time that even of this uh, hour of quarantine to, to impact and, and pray us uh, into a position that whenever it's lifted, that we are like arrows shot out of a bow and to be what he's called us to be and to show the power of the risen Savior in our lives. Amen. So I just want to just let's pray together right now and agree for this as we begin to just worship, finish this time with worship. Father, we bless you. We thank you that this is a reality. This is a piece of history that Jesus Christ of Nazareth rose from the dead. And Lord, even as uh, Billy Graham said, that there is more evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than there is that Alexander died at 33. Or, or even, uh, even the existence of Julius Caesar. There's more evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and even these pieces of history. So Lord, we celebrate this, Lord God. I pray that our lives would make sense in light of the resurrection. I pray, Father, that we would steward, we would be fearless, God, that we would prioritize the gospel. We'll be encouraged, Lord, with the fact that one day we will sing these, these songs or we will sing a new song before your throne. So, Lord, be glorified right now as we respond in faith to what you're speaking to us. Let us not try to work it up in our own ability, but let us call on the power of the Holy Spirit as we ask and surrender that like this dear saint, Betty Marlin, we honor her, God, what she's doing in the west side of Charlotte. Bless her, God. Bless that ministry. And we pray, Lord, we would also be whatever you've called us to be in this hour of history to make an impact, even if it's just one soul. I think about, Lord, that, that old story about that boy that was throwing you know, like countless um, starfish on the beach that had been washed up. He was just throwing one into the water. They picked him up, threw another one. And some older man walked by and said, do you really think you can do all these? Does it really matter? And that young boy said, it matters to this one. Lord, let that be our attitude. Let us not be overwhelmed. Lord, just do what you've called us to do before us for the one soul. Whoever it is, God, use us. Speak to us now as we worship you. Pray this in faith in Jesus.
God, I thank you that we do not have to fear death. Lord, I just thank you that, that you are alive. It says in 1 Peter that we are born again into a living hope. And that is you, Jesus. I, I agree so much, Lord God, that with the words that, that Wade shared tonight, that, Lord, we would respond to who you are and to the resurrection with our lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would reveal to us, God, the areas that, that we can step forward and share this beautiful gospel with the world. I just, I just love that, that there is no fear in death, that we have such a glorious hope in you, Lord. And I pray that, that that would transform us, God. That would transform us as we just, as we just remember, Lord, who you are, our Savior and our God. I just pray, Holy Spirit, that, that you would transform us and that we would be be awakened, oh Father God, awakened. Awakened to see a deeper revelation of the cross and of the resurrection. And that we would respond, Lord. Thank you, God. I pray that we, um, God, would, would bear the, the cup of, of, of hope and living water to the world and say, hey, Look what we have in our Savior, and that we would share it with joy in this time where there is so much fear. May the praises of our God be on our lips. May we walk in the light of your presence, God. Thank you, God. We invite you, Lord, all of us, Lord, to, to come. Come, we respond to you, Lord. Thank you, God. We receive, um, we receive this word tonight, and we say we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, God. I just want to end this evening by singing the same song we began with, and I know there's no words up there, but I want to sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So let's sing that together, and I, I pray that we would remember that this week, and that we would walk in that, that we would, we would fix our eyes on Jesus. So let's, let's sing this together um, as, we, as we close tonight. Your eyes upon Jesus and look for in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow
and um yeah we just we just bless you in the name of jesus and um i pray that um you all have a beautiful celebration of of the resurrection this weekend and tomorrow wherever you are and um yeah we i pray that that you would carry this spirit of worship with you throughout the week that the praises of of our god will be in our homes and on our lips and in our hearts in this time and in these days and we miss all of you and we just pray you're blessed in the name of jesus and thank you for for tuning in tonight and um we will look forward to seeing all of you next week so god bless you guys good night